first of all, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me to discuss this paper. It was really nice to have a, a sneak peek first look at this paper. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to do that. And also thank you to the authors because, I mean, as you will see in my discussion, uh, I, I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, it's a very, uh, very nice piece of work. So um, thank you for that. So just, a, I mean, a quick summary, which is my take on the paper. Um, I mean, the things I took away from it, so I advise everyone to read the paper for yourself because it's a very detailed uh, piece of work. I understand it's a, it's a first kind of step in the analysis of these data uh, because they're very rich. Uh, so, but the, the authors, they basically they analyze the factors, uh, particularly also the skills uh, that fac facilitate these transitions uh, into a green uh, and then green shortage job, so the two uh, dimensions, uh, with a focus on Belgium, which I think, I mean, we can all agree people here and here, like uh, sometimes it's very hard to bring all the data together. Uh, so it's very nice to see that uh, these data came together with also like uh, the help of the regional public uh, employment services. And then you use the, this re regression probability uh, approach uh, on, these, on the tran transitions. Uh, and what, you, what they find is that technical skills really emerge as one of the keys uh, in addressing uh, uh, some of the, the challenges ahead of us. Uh, in particular, they've, they find that the transitions to green shortage jobs tend to involve less skill disruption uh, than the green transition might require. Um, although they, I mean, differ significantly from other categories uh, in terms of income, uh, required skills, and education. So that's in a nutshell. Now, first of all, I mean, also looping back to uh, to what uh, the governor said before, I think this, I mean just to highlight how relevant the question is that the, the, the authors here are answering. So, I, I mean, we can disagree on some of the things that are being said in the Draghi report, but I think we can agree on one of these points, which I literally took from the report when I, I mean, look, when I first got the paper, I was like, okay, but this is in the report, this is exactly what we need. Because Draghi explicitly states like, okay, we have this skills gap, and what, I mean, one of the first recommendations is that we get our hands on better data, better intelligence of what is actually um, uh, happening there. So we are la lagging behind a bit uh, in terms of like our understanding and the data on uh, the skills gap. So I think I can only be very uh, positive about the paper here. I think it's really fi filling a gap and I think you can even highlight that better in the paper itself, um, the, the policy relevance of, of what you're doing. I mean, it's also very detailed and well written. Uh, so then maybe also to come in a bit, so as, as um, uh, as Raf said, I, I work for the European Investment Bank. There we have uh, a, a large survey of, of firms. So we, uh, we survey every year around 12,000 businesses across the EU and as a comparative sample uh, in the US. And we, one of the questions we ask them is, is really about the obstacles to investment for them. And what we see there is I, I just took one of the plots we have. I mean, we have it for all, uh, specifically the one for the EU and comparing also to Belgium. Uh, we have it for all the countries uh, and we have a specific report for Belgium as well if you are interested. But so there we see that, that the availability of skilled staff is one of the major obstacles that is typically reported. I mean, there's, there's obviously uncertainty about the future. Also, in, I mean, in the most recent version, we had, I mean, um, wave of the survey, energy costs also played up a lot. Uh, but I mean, typically availability of the skilled staff is a major issue. So again, there you're really on, I mean, uh, doing, I mean, addressing a question which is extremely relevant. So, okay, there are some differences across Europe, but I just wanted to highlight that, I mean, the relevance for Belgium there again. Now, when, when we go into the paper itself, uh, there's a lot to be, I mean, to be discussed. I think overall, I mean, the results make sense. I think if you look at some of, I mean, the regressions, I mean, it's no surprise that, say, permanent contracts, I mean, have a negative coefficient that you're going to shift uh, um, less free, I mean, transition less frequently. Now, when I saw this graph, I was a bit puzzled maybe, maybe, I mean, it's the, I mean, the alarm of an economist going off, but like, because you mentioned that you don't really go into it that much, so you see like the, the differences in the wage premiums basically for the green versus non-green, but then there's also what you can do in this graph is basically compare shortage versus non-shortage. And what you see there is that, I mean, the shortage jobs basically don't necessarily come at a huge premium. So as an economist, you would think, well, what's going on there? Because if you want to attract more people, you would raise 
the wages. I understand, and you also explain this further in the paper, that you haven't really explored the wage component of, um, of the data yet, but I would really uh, encourage you to do so because I think it's really interesting and I understand that also, as you explained in your presentation, there are, uh, the composition of these groups is different, so you would have to control for that, but it would be really interesting to see whether this, this, uh, this um, lack of kind of a premium there to attract uh, the right people uh, still holds up when you control for the other uh, components further. So that's just uh, something I, I was thinking about. Then um, I think, again, uh, it's a bit buried in the paper, but I think there's the sectoral component, you have the sectoral data, so I think this would also be very interesting to explore further. So this is, I mean, I understand it's preliminary work, so just giving a suggestions for further work here, um, because I think this can be very interesting, and I think you even mentioned it somewhere in a footnote that some of the transitions we might need to see or the shifts are actually, I mean, much larger at the sectoral level rather than the four categories you explained. So maybe, I mean, purely out of interest, I, I would like to see a bit more on that also because it can help inform policy uh, well, right? So where to, uh, to put uh, some of the focus of if, if there would be any interventions. Then another point I have is um, I mean, on, on the skills part. So um, this is, I mean, one of the key points in the paper. Um, but I think you can frame it further. So, um, I mean, you explain what is your uh, categorization of the skills, uh, the relevance of technical skills, they are found to be crucial, um, but you don't fully, I mean, sorry if I say so, but like, they, I think you can map them better also into earlier results here. So it's purely about extending the discussion, I think, to relate it a bit better uh, to, to earlier findings, partly because, I mean, I was thinking of, and I, I know it's not academic work, but I mean, there's this very interesting work done on the data on LinkedIn, for example, more recently, and they've been sharing it as well with academics uh, more and more. So, I mean, I just took this graph from one of their reports, and what they do is they look at, I mean, basically the data they have on LinkedIn, I fully understand, I mean, admin data you have, and, and large surveys like LFS, I mean, they are much more robust. Uh, LinkedIn data doesn't cover the whole population, and I understand the, the limitations and the caveats of these data, but what they do is they do nicely map them into different uh, skills, right? And they also have these skills uh, of the people on LinkedIn then transitioning into green jobs. Green jobs, as they have a very nice report on on green skills. So feel free. I mean, um, I would look into it a bit more. Maybe link it a bit. Uh, I think overall the findings are relatively similar in the sense of like you find the technical skills matter a lot. So what you here see is also nat natural sciences, utilities. I mean, mathematics, construction. They are also very high up there. Um, for I mean, for having people more likely to shift. So I think it it, it relate. I mean. I think the, the link is, is easily made and it, it maps into, into what you find well, but I think you can highlight that a bit more maybe. Um, so then um, finally, maybe a bit more on the policy conclusions. So I fully agree, I mean, with the results that trading matters. Uh, I think we just have to think a bit further about how to then do we take this result and what do we do with it? Uh, so there's a good discussion in there um, I mean, uh, relating to some possible um, um, initiatives, but I think we can take it a bit further in the sense that, I mean, I mean, we also have evidence, for example, from, I mean, for our, from our data uh, where we observe that actually, I mean, because there are multiple ways to tackle this, right? Training can be provided by multiple uh, sources, but I think training on the job by firms is clearly a big part of this. Uh, so and what we do in our data, for example, is we look at the, the amount of training offered by firms. So we have this in the survey. Uh, so what we observe there is actually that, um, so if you compare firms that, uh, that report skills as a major obstacle, so the blue line to those that, um, without, sorry, and then those that do, do, do report it as a major obstacle, um, they do provide more training to their, their staff, and training has also picked up again since, I mean, since COVID, but it's only marginally more. So it's not necessarily, I mean, that those firms that really are lacking the, the skilled staff uh, are also providing uh, more, um, more, substantially more training to them. Um, 
In addition, we also see that actually when we look at it from a sectoral point of view, relating to my point earlier also on the relevance of the sectoral point, is that actually uh, there's not necessarily the firms that, I mean, um, or in the sectors that actually need the skills most are actually the ones providing most of the training. Um, even though we also have some empirical evidence that shows that, I mean, this positive, I mean, that there's a positive significant relationship between firm growth, say, in investment assets, and the actual amount of training provided in-house. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that a bit because I think we have to think a bit further on then how to fill this, uh, this gap in terms of training because we see that it's not necessarily directly being done uh, by the market at this stage. Um, so, and finally also we see that, for example, I mean, in the statistics that participation of adults in learning uh, is actually relatively low, still relatively low across the board uh, in Europe with some exceptions. But so if we want, I mean, adults to, to pick up the skills, I think we, uh, we need some uh, further interventions there. Um, okay, so finally, uh, what you, you mentioned in the, in the discussion as well is about like, um, and I, again, I agree on this, that there's like this, um, the, the importance of possibly adding, like a, you have it as a proposal, that there's this, this lack of, well, currently a rather stringent experience in, uh, in terms of uh, these accreditations uh, of, of the different trainings. And again, I think you can relate this as well to some of the proposals that are already out there. For example, I mean, again, sorry to reference the Draghi report, but there's a, also a specific proposal in there about uh, having a better um, accreditation of training, on-the-job training, as well as, I mean, um, um, I say like adult training uh, across EU even, so to make this a, a bit easier. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to discuss.